You know, the Lord just impressed upon me this week. I've just had a, a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving all week long to have the opportunity to preach the Word of God. Um, it's just glorious to be able to preach God's Word. To um, study His Word. To have a place such as this in which to worship. Instruments and music to glorify and magnify Christ. You know how, how wonderful it is to be a child of God? Be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And to do what we do in this place. Uh, from week to week. I've had a great week. And I want to I wanna tell you we're in Deuteronomy today. And do you know that the book of Deuteronomy is quoted over 80 times in the New Testament? Uh, Jesus used it all the time. When he was approached, like I told the children this morning, which is the greatest commandment? He quoted right from Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I mean, he quoted it. It's a central book of the Bible. Turn with me, if you will, to that book this morning, to chapter 10. And we'll be looking at verses 12 and 13 in a little bit, okay? Do you know what Deuteronomy means? It means second giving. The reason it's called Deuteronomy second giving is because... Uh, Moses broke the first giving of the law. You remember that? When he came down from Mount Sinai and saw and heard the people worshiping the idol, the golden calf, Moses got mad. And he threw the tablets down and broke them into pieces. And then God spoke to Moses the second time. This is what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. At that time the Lord said to me, Hew out two tablet, tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me into the mount, and make an ark of wood, and I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. Aren't you glad for second chances? Aren't you thankful for a second word from God? You know what Deuteronomy is all about? Deuteronomy is all about do-overs. Second time. Second opportunities. I need a second time. A second opportunity. I rarely ever get it right the first time. <laughs> you know? Just ask my wife. She knows. I, only, I, I not only need second times, I need third times and fourth times. Just think about it. The, the, the apostle Peter needed a second chance, didn't he? First time he denied the Lord. And the rooster crowed. The Bible said he went out and wept. And then, thank God, Jesus showed up on the seashore and had a fire burning and breakfast cooking and Peter came to shore. God said, Peter, I mean, Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. Gave him a second chance. How about the prodigal son? Remember him? He went off in the far country and wasted his family's wealth. The Bible says in riotous living. Have you ever wasted money? Sure you have. Just wasted it. This boy did. The Bible says his daddy was looking for him. Anxious for him. You reckon his daddy prayed for him while he was away? Sure. That young man came home and got a second time with his father and with his family. How about King David? King David was an adulterer. 
He was a murderer. Unfaithful to his wife and a disappointment to God. Created me a clean heart, O oh God, he said. And renew. That's what revival is. Revival is that time of renewal. Renew a right spirit within me. And God gave him that opportunity. And through his Psalms, countless numbers of people have been encouraged to, to follow God more closely. King David got a second chance. If King David got a second chance, I and you, all of us, have an opportunity. Even the Apostle Paul needed a second chance. You remember he uh, dismissed John Mark. John Mark was a young protege, a young colleague, and he got frightened, and he got homesick, and he went home. And Paul dismissed him as if his ministry was of no account. The Bible says later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, listen to what Paul says about John Mark. He says, bring up Mark. The, uh, Paul is advanced in age at this point. He said, bring up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. You never grow too old to need somebody to help you do the work of the Lord. Deuteronomy is all about second chances. If you're here this morning, and this week's been a difficult week, and you've stumbled along the way, you've erred in your devotion, Deuteronomy is for you. You get a second chance. A new opportunity. A fresh start with God. Deuteronomy gives testimony to that. Now you can say amen if you want to. <laughs> Listen to this. Themes that are current in Deuteronomy. Unity and character of God. Listen, there is no multiplicity with God. Okay? You just mark that down. God is singular, all right? A culture would tell us, you know, it doesn't matter who you serve or what you do as long as you are sincere. Every road leads to the same place. Kind of a relativity. Not so in the Word of God. Not so in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Amen. There is no Mormon God. There is no uh, Muslim God. There is no Buddhist God. There is no uh, Hindu God. There is one Lord God. And it is Him whom we serve, according to the book of Deuteronomy. Love is a central theme in Deuteronomy, not the law. Okay? Now, the, the book is full of the law, but the reason the law is given is because of the love of God. Okay? It's full. Listen to what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. You need to write that one down. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. Listen. If you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swore unto your fathers, and he will love you. Do you hear that? He loves us. Oh, how, how does the song, oh, how he loves us. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the land, your corn, your wine, and your oil, and the increase of your line, and the flock of your sheep, and the land which he swore to give unto your fathers. We're not talking here about a prosperity Bible 
or a prosperity gospel. What we're talking about here is the abundance of God's love. I mean, think about your children. Why do you lavish upon your... I've seen what you do with your children. I've seen it. Why do you lavish upon your children? Why do you hover over your children? Why do you give? It's because you love them. And you keep them and you care for them. He loves us. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 8. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman for the hand of, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God does what he does because he loves us. Obedience. That's number three. That's a central theme in the book of Deuteronomy. Obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. God, God wants our obedience unto him, not because he's harsh, not because he's hard, not because he's uh, legal in his nature. He does it because he wants us to be better. He wants us to be different. He's forming and fashioning a people for himself that are above the world, that act better than the world acts. That's what he wants from us. We are his showcase. Now we, we had at our school, my, I went to high school at the oldest school in Davidson County, Donaldson High School. My daddy went to Donaldson High School before me. And we had a trophy case at that school that was as long as the, as the hallway down the entire school. And there were pictures in it of classes and there were trophies in it of special uh, uh, first place honors that were achieved by that school. Why did we show off through trophies? Because we were a special school. We were proud of our school. Listen, God is proud of his people. God wants the best for his people. And you are his showcase. How would, he, how would the world ever know anything about him without you and without me and without this book? Do you know what this book is? It is the testimony of God's people. That's what it is. It's all about the people who follow him. Now, God doesn't demand that you be perfect. It's impossible. The only perfect is he. He is perfect. But he wants us to strive toward it in order that we might be different. His people. So obedience is a part of Deuteronomy. Renewal, I've already talked about that a little bit. Renewal is a part of Deuteronomy. Every day, every day is a fresh opportunity to start over with God. Someone has said, life always offers us a second chance. It's called tomorrow. It's about renewal and how God longs for us to become better and better and better in our relationship with Him. Deuteronomy chapter 10, that leads us to our scripture passage this morning. Chapter 10, verses 10. Verses um, 12 and 13. If you'll stand, we'll read together this passage of Scripture. Listen to what God says. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Verse 13. 
to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day for thy good. You may be seated, and may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Five words you need to take away from church with you this morning. Five words. I can hear you right now say, oh gosh, preacher's got five points in this sermon. Five words. Fear. Walk. Love. Serve. Keep. When you get up in the morning and you take your shower and you stand in front of the mirror and you get yourself ready for the day, those five words is what God's looking for. Fear, walk, love, serve, keep. What does the Bible mean when it says, fear the Lord your God? It's not talking about being afraid of God. It's not talking about trembling when you mention His name. If I were to ask you this morning, what is the most important relationship you have. Some of you might say my spouse, my significant other. Some of you might say my family or my children. That's the most significant relationship. And when I say the most, who gets first dibs, top billing in your life? First place and primary devotion is what the Bible means when it says fear. It's it's about what is really awesome to you. What do you reverence most? What do you respect most? That's one thing I, I notice about our culture. We're learning very rapidly how not to respect most anything. Respect is absent from our lives. The Bible is talking about a healthy kind of fear. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Do you hear that? I mean, you, you, you think about the knowledge you have of your job. I mean, you may be the, the person who knows how to do what you do better than anybody else in the company. Uh, Think about the knowledge you have of your family and how you uh, attempt to uh, break through and learn everything you can learn about what's going on with your your, uh, relationships to your spouse and to your children. Uh, You don't want to be misinformed when it comes to your children, do you? The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. You think about that. Families that are trying to get by without a relationship to God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, listen, when, when Jesus was tempted by Satan to throw himself down and worship him, you know how Jesus responded? He said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only Shall you serve? That doesn't leave any room for anything else. How can you worship the devil when you've got God in first place? Fearing God is a natural response to what God commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 5 when he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your might. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and lean not not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. I like the way the Living Bible puts that. The Living Bible says in everything you do. I mean you just take one part of it. I mean when when it comes to keeping up the yard at your house. Okay, you think about what it takes to keep up the yard and the outside of your home. 
Think about it. Everything you have to do. You have to cut the shrubs. You have to trim the shrubs. You have to mow the grass, right? You have to uh, trim the trees. You have to pick the, the fruit. You have to clip the roses. You have to do all of these jobs. You have, to, you have to repaint. You have to caulk. You have to do all of those things. The Bible says that everything you do, put God first. <laughs> put God first. You know, God's more important than the house you live in. He is. God's more important than the grass that you cut. Uh, you know, I have a problem with that, seeing people cut grass on Sunday morning. Don't you? God's more important than that. I like what Tom Landry made. You young people, if you're 30 years old and younger, you don't know who Tom Landry was, right? Anybody in here who doesn't know who Tom Landry was? Yeah, okay. Coach of the Dallas Cowboys from 1960 to 1988. He put 20 winning seasons together with the Dallas Cowboys, and it's a record that no one will ever break. Okay? Listen to what this man said. The thrill of knowing Jesus is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I think God has put me in a very special place and expects me to use it to His glory in everything I do. Whether coaching football or talking to the press, I'm always a Christian. Christ is first, family is second, and football is third. Now there's a man that fears God. Putting God first. Everything else. You remember what Jesus said about it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things, all this stuff, everything will be added unto you. That's what fearing God means. When, quite simple. Maybe, maybe I should have just said it this simply this morning. When you get up in the morning, and you look yourself in the mirror, say, God first today. God first today. And that is what the Bible talks about when it says, fear the Lord your God. Number two. Number two. I got two minutes. <laughs> number two. And I'm just on number two. Wow. Well, wow, that word is walk. Such an important word, walk in all your ways. You remember when God made man, put him in the garden, he did everything that was necessary. He made man in, 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 uh, according to his own image. Uh, that means that he put the very best into man. Man was special above all the, uh, of the created order. Uh, man was closest uh, to God's likeness. The Bible says he put him in the garden. He didn't put him out in the desert. He put him in a very special place. And, and if you want to read about that this afternoon, you just go to Genesis and you see everything that was surrounding man and you'll understand how special man was because God put him in that very special place fashioned specifically for him. Now after, he even provided a helpmate. The Bible says it was not good, chapter 2, verse 18. It wasn't good for man to be alone. So he fashioned woman to be with him, to help him. The Bible says she was a special helper unto the man. God gave him everything. Unfortunately, he sinned and disappointed God. Now I want you to focus on Genesis chapter 3, 8 because this is the point. Even after man sinned, listen, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I want to tell you something. When you sin, when you stray, when you don't feel like doing what God wants you to do, it doesn't stop God from walking. You know that? It doesn't matter how far away you stray. God keeps on walking. And the point is, is that you don't walk by yourself and God does not walk alone, but you walk together with Him. That's His desire. That's what He is after. When you get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, not only do you say fear, put God first, but I'm going to walk with Him today. I'm going to get close to Him today. You, 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 you know why I got so excited this week? I just got in Genesis and walked with God for a while. You can't help but be up when you're walking with Him. Do you know how God walks? Listen to what Micah says. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, to love mercy, listen to this, and to walk humbly with your God. It's not only about your attitude, it's about your your stepping, your walking together with God. Let me just ask you, do you remember when you used to walk down the street with your sweetheart holding hands? You remember that? Now come on. I mean, when Robbie and I walked down the street, we just didn't hold hands. It was like intertwined. It was that special hand holding, you know? Did you ever do that? You remember, you remember the days when uh, this was before bucket seats and captain's chairs and middle consoles in the car. You only had that bench over there and there was no seat belt laws and she was right there. I mean, there was no distance between. Right? You remember that? I mean, I've got a truck, a red Silverado 84 truck and there's no console in that thing. I mean, there's a bench seat and it even has a middle life belt, seat belt, middle seat belt. And when she rides with me, where does she sit? Over there. (laughs) On the other side. What in the world happened? You know, you know the mileage, the, the years, the kids, I'm talking about that time before the mortgage, before the career, you know, before you had to balance the checkbook and make everything work out, before all those worries and cares. You know what I'm talking about? When it was just you and her or uh, you and him, when it was just you. Uh, You know what Robbie and I used to do? We used to save our our money and we would would pull it all together, our coins. There wasn't anything, there wasn't any green money. It was just coins. We'd save our coins and we'd go to the Nashville airport and we'd save our coins for the parking lot. Now don't think dirty. We didn't park. We didn't go parking in the airport parking lot. We didn't do that. We'd save our coins to pay the park, pay to park in order that we could go up on the observation deck and sit there and hold hands and talk with each other while planes took off and landed. That was our special time. And our special place. Look, you've got to learn to walk together before you live together. I think society's got it flipped now, right? You gotta you gotta walk together in order to earn the right to live together. You gotta walk together with God. And the closer you walk with Him, the more more uh Intimate you become with Him. That's what walking is all about. It's getting to know your Creator, uh, your God, and your Savior. 
I think that's enough about walking. <laughs> um, you remember that old song? That old hymn? I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Love. The third one is love. And I want you to, I want you to notice the progression here. You, you, have a, you have an awesome respect for God. You, you fear Him. You walk with Him. And then comes love. In terms of love, it says in, uh, in our text today, to love Him. Do you believe and know today that God loves you? Do you believe that God who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has made us alive together with Christ? I want to tell you the love of God in Christ Jesus helps you to come alive in Him. You are spiritually dead outside the love of God, the Bible says. Do you know down deep in your soul that in this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him? Are you persuaded this morning that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You believe that? If you believe that, then why not love Him back? I, I don't know of anybody that you might talk to out on the street that would deny the love of God. You know? But like Billy Graham said, Billy Graham said, God gave us two hands. God gave us two hands, one to receive and the other to give back. Love works that way. We get the love of God in order to give the love of God. We, we get the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we give the love of God back through faith in Him and Him alone. In the days when Dwight L. Moody was pastor of the tabernacle in Chicago, there was a man who was a little bit intoxicated. Stood in front of the front the first steps. There's several steps that lead up to the front doors of that great church. And he stood in front thinking about whether to go in or not. He was a bit inebriated and he, he walked up the steps, opened the door. And when he opened the door, there was no one inside. And he was con confronted by the motto which was over the pulpit. And the motto over the pulpit read simply, God is love. And the intoxicated man said, God is love. He said it out loud and then he said, God is not love. If God was love, then he would love me and he hates me. With that, he shut the door. He walked down the steps and, and stumbled off around, the, around the, uh, the block. And as he walked, he, he kept saying that over and over and over again. He said, God is love. God is not love. God is love. God is not love. And finally he made his way around the block and there he was standing in front of the tabernacle again in front of those steps and those front doors. And he just stood there for a moment as people passed him by walking up the steps into the church for service. And as they walked by, he just walked with them and found himself in the pew. The great Dr. Moody preached his sermon. And at the end of the sermon, the man sat in his seat. He didn't leave immediately like everyone else. And Dr. Moody came over to him and said, Sir, can I help you? 
The man began to weep. And um, Dr. Moody asked him, he said, what in my sermon, what in my sermon touched your heart? And the man said, oh, there was nothing, preacher. I, I can't even remember what you said this morning. But it's those words right there. God is love. Dr. Moody sat down next to him and took his Bible and went through the Bible and talked about the love of God to this man. And the man gave his heart to Christ. I tell you, that's the beginning. The love of God which passes understanding. Oh, how He loves you and me. His love deserves our love back unto Him. Fourthly, serve. Serve the Lord thy God. You remember um, what Jesus said to the disciples? They were wondering about who was the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus said to them, He said, you know, there's some people who want authority. There's some people who want to rule over other people. Some people like to be the boss. Some people crave the primary spots, the chief seats, and want to be recognized. But it's not like that with you. He who would be great will be servant of all. Jesus redefined greatness. I've just been amazed this week. Uh, We're right in the middle of NFL playoffs. There's going to be two games today. You been watching that? I mean, we've heard all about uh, Tom Brady. And we, we were, we've heard all about uh, the uh, discount double check guy. Who's he with? Uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers with the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay, Green Bay there you go. Heard about him. Uh, we've heard about um, uh, Russell Wilson. I, I understand that with Marshawn Lynch, there's there's a petition out with 32,000 signatures begging that he be able to play even though he abused his child. Heard this week about rape allegations with Josh McNary who plays for the Colts. I mean, there's all kind of hype and all kind of uh, publicity going on, but there's something I've, never, I've not heard at all. I've not heard the name mentioned of the guy on the sidelines, who cleans off the football. Have you heard that? I've not heard one word from any sports commentator about the guy who comes into the locker room after all the millionaires have left and cleans up. You heard about him? Hmm? No, no word about him or her or whatever group that is that does that. I've not heard anything about the water boy that uh, provides fresh water for the players on and off the field. Those folks who serve the needs of the, uh, of the superstars, you don't hear about them, do you? You know what my point is here? My point is this. When... Uh, when the press doesn't know who you are. And when the elected officials could care less about your needs. You know? And when the, uh, the wealthy and the well-to-do can pass you on the street and never even notice that you're there. <clears throat> who knows your name? Huh? Who loves you? Who cares about you? You know, 
God knows, and He cares. And I'd rather be known by Him than be front page on anybody's newspaper. Listen to me. If anyone serves, you remember this verse. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Do you feel special this morning? Do you feel honored by God? He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows your needs. And He honors you in Christ Jesus. One more point. Thank you for enduring to the end. <laughs> the word keep. You know, I talked with you about obedience. That obedience is not just legalistic. It is it is a means by which and through which God demonstrates who He is through us and the way we live our lives above the world, above culture. That's what 1 John says. 1 John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. We're called to be different. We're called to be better. There's a, there's a story, uh, I read about some businessmen this week that were rushing through the uh, airport in Chicago, cold up in Chicago. And these businessmen had been to a week-long conference, they had been to class, they'd, been, they'd heard speakers all week long, and they had told their families that they would be back home by uh, late Friday evening in order to spend the weekend with them. And so they got out of the conference a little bit late and it was going to really rush them to get them to the airplane in time and they were rushing, running through the airport trying to make the gate and went through security, went through baggage claim, all the things that they had to do and it was last minute, they, they were there and it was last call and there was a young lady who had a fruit stand right there at the gate and they rushed by her and one of the men stumbled on the leg of her table and fruit went everywhere. All of the guys were so intense about making the flight they just ran on to the gate and went through except for one man. And he turned around and looked and saw the young lady down on her hands and knees trying to Get the food, in, uh, getting the fruit in order so that she could replace it on the table and that kind of thing. She was having a difficult time because the hallway was crowded and people were coming and going, and no one had bent down to help this young lady. And so he yelled out to his friends as they approached the plane. He said, "Y'all call my wife and tell her I'm going to catch another flight, and I'll be a little bit late getting home." With that, he turned around and went back to help the young lady. And as he approached her, he found the reason that she was having trouble getting the fruit back uh, in order was because she was blind. She could not see. And she was reaching, you know. So the man came up to her and he took her by the shoulders and lifted her up and took her over to one of those seats there in the, in the waiting area and set her down. And he went back over and he picked up all the fruit and he placed it back on the table and the bruised pieces of fruit he put in a separate place. And then he went back over to her and apologized for what he and his friends had done. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out a $50 bill and he said, here, you take this because some of the fruit is damaged and for your time and for your trouble, and we are so sorry. 
And as he turned to walk away, as he turned to walk away and to go and redeem his ticket and arrange another flight, he heard the girl say, he said, she said, Thank you, sir. Are you Jesus? You know, we are the only Jesus people see. Many. That's why the Bible tells us to fear, to walk, to love, to serve, and to keep His commandments. It's because we are the Jesus people that this world desperately needs. Every day we live. I want to invite you this morning to respond to the message to come to Jesus as He leads you, whether to join this church, become a Christian, be born again, to redecorate, to rededicate your life. However the Lord would move you this morning, you be faithful to come. Elizabeth is here and she will play and we will pray and respond as you respond to the preaching of God's Word and the movement of His Spirit. Let's stand as we sing together this morning.